what were the big lessons that you learned from data about being successful in dating then? Uh, uh, there are like a lot of different lessons. Uh, there are, okay, so one of them is from, I, I love this. People may have heard of it, but I, if you haven't, you need to know it. Uh, Christian Rudder wrote this excellent book, Dataclism, and he made the point that the most successful daters are like, the, the, the very most successful daters are exactly who you'd expect. They're like Brad Pitt and Natalie Portman, just beautiful people. And they just get like, it's depressing how much better they do than the average person. Uh, like, uh, but then like, there are these, there are these daters that do shockingly well. And they're people with extreme looks, like people who shave their head, like what, heterosexual women who shave their head or have crazy glasses or blue hair or all these things. And the point is in dating, you want to be polarizing. So if you're Brad Pitt or Natalie Portman, you just want to be yourself and not scare anybody. Just like play it very safe. Let the goodies flood to you. But if you are not Natalie Portman or Brad Pitt or you're not like conventionally the most attractive person, you got to kind of lean into some extreme version of yourself. And then some people will be totally turned off, but some people will be really into you. And that's kind of what's that's all that matters. You just need some people to be really into you. And I kind of did that in my own life because I think it's not going to surprise anybody that like I'm pretty nerdy. I mean, anybody who read Don't Trust Your Gut would be like, this guy's pretty nerdy. Like uh, there's this one study where they list the happiest. They have a chart with the happiest, how much happiness every activity gives people. And I literally ordered an iPhone case with that chart on it so I can look at the data when I'm deciding what to do with things. So I'm like the nerdiest, like I'm, I'm maybe one of the nerdiest people you know, anybody's encountered. And I think when I was single, like a lot of nerds, I'm like, well, what do I do to, you know, I'm heterosexual to, you know, attract women. And I'm like, okay, well, I gotta, you know, tone it down, be less nerdy, uh, be, you know, like, you know, get rid of the glasses, get, get like, you know, stop talking about the charts and the tables and the math and like, you know, learn, talk more about, uh, what you're 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 taught that uh, the average woman is into, and I think the data suggests the exact opposite. Like nerd it up, go all in on who you are, and then you'll just be polarizing. But you don't in dating, you don't want to be like average to people. You want to be like the extreme, something that's uh, the most the most appealing. Well, because you're not optimizing for total area under the curve, are you? You only yeah, need a no. couple of winners. And yeah, and exactly. And you know, well, a, I like how you think a couple of, of winners. Well, you, you, you <laughs> so got to have a variety, po- right? Polyamorous. <laughs> no, I'm monogamous, so I was just looking for one winner. But, uh, uh, but I, yeah, and my uh, girlfriend, literally, she was uh, talking to her friends, and they're like, "What's your type?" And everyone's going through their type, like tall, dark, and handsome, this, that. And she's like, "My type is nerdy." <laughs> and, like that was her type. And she's not even that nerdy herself. Her type was nerdy. And then, you know, and here I am. If I had not played off my nerdiness, I wouldn't have, have had a chance. And I think the the thing that the other big dating thing is you got to put yourself out there way more. Uh, so they've done these studies on like what happens when people of different attractiveness or desirability ratings message someone else on, on an online dating site. So like what happens when a one message is 10? On an online dating site and before i saw the data i'm like this is a bloodbath this is like a one asking out of 10 i mean or message 10 we're talking about like a one in a million a one in a billion like come on like that that's not going to happen and the data says for a heterosexual man one asking out a heterosexual 10 it's like 14 percent and for a heterosexual woman asking out a one ask going after a heterosexual man it's like 30 percent so like when you actually do the math, the key to getting like if you if you want to date out of your league, which I don't necessarily recommend because I also have in a section how physical conventional attraction is the most overvalued thing in the in the dating market. But let's be honest, everybody's trying to like everybody is curious how can I date someone who's way more beautiful or way more desirable than me? And I think it's a combination of being an extreme version of yourself and then asking tons of people out. Uh, because like if you have a 14% chance on one go, then you actually do the math. If you ask like 30 people out, you have like a 98% chance. So like all you got to do is just keep on 
going after it. And a lot of people are going to be like, no, 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 no. And eventually uh, you're going to get your, your yes. And then there are, yeah, there are, there are other things I could keep going. There are but what what was things. the insight around physical attractiveness and happiness? Yeah. So they've done studies of like 11,000 couples and they tried to predict what, uh, what predicts romantic happiness. So Samantha Joel led the, led this study. Uh, and it's like the big, it's like a revolutionary study of romantic happiness. They they use machine learning models. There were 86 scientists th- studying it, uh, like 11,000 couples. They had hundreds of variables, like anything you could, c- could consider a test. And the first thing is it's very hard in general to predict who's happy. Like the predictive models are just way worse than you might imagine. It's not like uh, predicting, I don't know, predicting like the weather tomorrow or something. It's like predicting the weather in like, three years. <laughs> like it's, it's, it's harder than you'd, than you'd guess. But that said, the things that Matt, that do have at least some predictive power, whether, I, whether I'm happy with someone else, whether a particular person has someone else, the qualities, the other person that seem to have some predictive power are like these psychological variables. So secure attachment style, growth mindset, conscientiousness, satisfaction with life, uh, kind of like good psychological variables. And the things that don't have that have like basically no predictive power are a lot of superficial things. So conventional attractiveness, uh, the height of your partner, uh, the, occup- the particular occupation of your partner, uh, many things like that. And so all the of the things thing that online apps that optimize for yeah. on the front end. Yeah. Yeah. So like so. Yeah. So it, it I think like the ma- the major insight from the data on, on dating and romance is there's just a total disconnect between what people are trying to like what people are swiping for or trying to uh, date and what actually makes people happy. Uh, You know, will people change based on knowing that? I don't know. Uh, I think it may be coded in our DNA that we're drawn to like beauty and, you know, height and status. And, uh, but like, if, if, if you can, I really do recommend uh, overruling some of those instincts because they're really not a path uh, to long-term happiness. And like the other thing is you have to think is that the competition for these traits is so enormous that like, even if you win over someone, like if you, if you win over someone who is this, you know, great beauty or a woman, every, every woman's there, I think the data is 85% of women, or I don't remember the exact number have like, six footer above on bumble or whatever it is it's some insane Which i think is only 14 percent of men in the yeah. u.s yeah yeah and it's like and like uh so the competition for these people are hero- are is ferocious and you have to think that if you first of all if you try to date these people you may spend a huge percent of your life single and complaining that you're single like i think a lot of people who are perpetually single they're trying to date the small number of people that everybody's trying to date. Uh, And number two, if you do win them over, you may find that they are like, that there's a reason that they were single, even though they have all these traits that everybody's desiring. So maybe their psychological traits are a little bit uh, subpar. I would love Uh, to see, I would love to see the um, physical characteristics mapped with the psychological traits. You know what are the correlates between are taller people on average more conscientious or more industrious or oh, yeah. more balanced? Because that would be fascinating to see. Because it it could be, it actually could be that in order to be with someone who's hot, you need to sacrifice being with someone who's psychologically. I mean, it's probably not likely, right? They're probably pretty just randomly spread. Well, but that could be the case. I think if you're not hot and you want to date someone hot, then you probably do have to sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, but you know so, if you're like. If you're hot yourself, then you're probably like, okay, you probably, you know, it's probably, it's somewhat of a market. Uh, you're probably in, in better, in better. You shape, can always yeah. uh, date across and down. Yeah. Well, the the interesting thing there is what what you're kind of saying is similar to what John Berger says in uh, Make the First Move, where it's 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 not lowering your standards; it's changing what your standards consist of. 
Because what you're saying is that what you think your standards should be aren't what they should be. You're optimizing for the wrong parameters. What you're optimizing for is something like height and job title and a bunch of things which aren't going to impact the thing that you ultimately want, which is long-term relationship happiness. What you need to do is reset that. And by doing that, you actually open up an entire new market, which is less competitive, potentially untapped, and significantly more linear between where you are and where you want to be in terms of happiness. Yeah, but nobody wants to hear that advice. No, it's just shit, like, it's shit dating me. advice. How do I get the hot yeah. person? How do, yeah. I get the, how do I get the fitty? Which I told you, the way to get the hot person is to be an extreme version of yourself and ask out lots of people. And the oh, oh, the other thing I didn't say is take advantage of similarity. So uh, people are incredibly drawn. This is also shown in, da- in uh, dating apps to people who are similar to themselves. Like on every trait you can imagine. So race, uh, people are drawn to people who are similar to themselves, uh, religion, uh, like height, height, height to some degree, uh, even like college, people don't just want to date someone of a similar education level. They like show a bonus to someone who went to, the, to their exact same university, uh, even if it's like relative to someone in a sim- so similar ranked university uh, that you know, there, there's, and then, oh, my favorite example of this is we're 11.3% more likely on online dating apps to match with someone who shares our initials, uh, which is so ridiculous. Like, come on, initials, like sharing your initials is not the path to long-term happiness. But so, th- so I think there's a lot of irrationality in that, but you can take advantage of that in that try, like if, if you share your initials with someone, Definitely ask them out because you have this bonus. <laughs> oh, right. You've got like the multiplier. That's the 11.4% yeah. multiplier on that. Oh, well, she's a she's a nine out of 10, but she does have my initials. So if I take that, she's actually only, re- she's like a, a, a parameter adjusted eight and a half with when we account for the, the name bias. But yeah, and I think I learned this in my single life where I am Jewish and, but I'm I'm not religious at all. And I always pride myself on not caring about uh, religion. Like I would be happy to date somebody of any re- religious background, any cultural background, whatever. It's not something that I view as very, very important to me. But I did kind of notice that the quality of my dates were always higher with the Jewish community than the non-Jewish community because of this similarity bias. So even if I don't care, like even if it's not a preference for me, I can take advantage of the fact that it's a preference for other people and I should probably be more likely to go to like a singles event for Jewish people than a singles event for non-Jewish people. Because in the non-Jewish singles event, I'm going to be a five or whatever. But yep. the Jewish single that event, Jewish privilege, I'm man. Jewish privilege in the Jewish. No, not, <laughs> I know no, what you mean. It's, it's, it's Chinese privilege. privilege in the Chinese event. Yeah. It's Asian privilege in the yeah. I understand. Yeah, and it's like it's true for Asian males as well. There, I talk about the there's a huge prejudice against Asian males in online dating, uh, but there's much less pre prejudice from Asian women in this in, in this group. So yeah, it's a, it's a privilege that like, you know, yeah. again, my major advice is care less about these superficial things and just try to find someone who's like really nice and can make you happy. And if you can get to that mindset, you're going to find dating way, way easier. Uh, but if you want to date like a hot person, then you have to use all these strategies and and everything that I think are, are justified in the data. Use your privilege uh, is, is one of them. What's happening, people? If you enjoyed that, then press here for the full unedited episode. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.